Well, good evening, everyone. It is a pleasure to be with you all, and many thanks to the Colonial Williamsburg Foundation for hosting and organizing such a wonderful forum. Recent scholarship on early American furniture has been greatly enhanced through the discovery of new manuscript materials and pieces of furniture produced by American cabinetmakers. This new material has allowed scholars to present more complete studies of the lives of early craftsmen, including such figures as Nathaniel Gould, Nathan Lombard, and Isaac Bowes, studies of which have all been published in recent years and can be seen here on the screen. Similar to these more recent studies, this presentation highlights several furniture-related discoveries that have helped to shed new light on the life and career of Greenfield, Massachusetts cabinet maker Daniel Clay. These discoveries not only challenge common assumptions surrounding Clay's life, but also, as we will see, larger themes in the study of American furniture. Noteworthy among these recent discoveries and the extant furniture produced by Clay is that many descended directly in the families of their original owners to the present, that is, they were kept in the family, and were marked at times heavily with genealogical inscriptions. In addition, therefore, to discussing recent discoveries, this presentation of Clay's work briefly explores the larger topic of family heirlooms in the American home. Perceptions of the early American home cannot be properly understood without also considering the important place of family heirlooms in the domestic space. A native of Connecticut, Daniel Clay began his cabinet-making work in Greenfield, Massachusetts, about 1795. His work as a cabinet maker, however, proved to be somewhat unreliable, which caused him to take on a variety of occupations throughout the course of his life. By 1812, he was still working in Greenfield, but as an apothecary. In 1823, he returned to cabinet making, but gave up that business in 1829 when he moved to Guilford in southern Vermont to open a pail factory business. Clay eventually left that business, returned to Greenfield, and by 1831 had moved to New York City, where he lived out the remainder of his life working as a druggist. He died in New York City in 1848. Surviving pieces of Clay's furniture show that he worked primarily in the Rococo or Chippendale style, even long after it went out of fashion. Furniture produced by Clay in the late 18th and early 19th centuries exhibit traditional elements of the Rococo style, not neoclassical. Chests of drawers, for instance, feature bracket feet and surface ornament in the form of gadruning. Tables feature similar gadruning as well as straight rectangular or marlboro legs. Clay's clients clearly preferred the older style over the new neoclassical style, and Clay was more than willing to accommodate their preferences. This is not to say, however, that Clay did not experiment with the newer neoclassical style. This Pembroke table is, one might describe, transitional. The table's straight, tapered legs exhibit the simplicity of the federal style, but the curved cross stretchers with decorative piercings reveal a more Rococo aesthetic. The table is noteworthy, however, in that a recent review of the piece yielded exciting new information concerning the table's provenance. Though the table has been in Deerfield's collection for 50 years, virtually nothing was known concerning its history of ownership. This changed with a recent inspection of the table, which yielded evidence of several graphite inscriptions on the drawer of the table. With the aid of an IRF camera, we were able to decipher the following inscriptions. Here in this image of the inside of the drawer, we found the inscription, quote, Table of Merrick P. Slate. On the underside of the drawer was a much larger inscription, which we have traced over in red, which reads, quote, Merrick P. Slate, Bernardston, Mass., 1860. The town of Bernardston being just north of where Daniel Clay was working in Greenfield, Massachusetts. Other names and words are likely inscribed on the table, perhaps kin of Merrick P. Slate, but time and where have rendered them illeg illegible. Research has revealed that Merrick P. Slate, native of Bernanston, Massachusetts, was born in 1846, 
married in 1869, and later moved to Greenfield where he died in 1921. Though not the original owner of the table, it was nonetheless reassuring to find that the table was owned locally. Another recent discovery helped to illustrate Clay's versatility as a craftsman. Given that Clay's surviving body of work overwhelmingly exhibits features of the Rococo style, the museum was particularly pleased when this Daniel Clay neoclassical style chest of drawers surfaced, presently in a private collection. Using this 1966 advertisement in Antiques magazine in which the chest appears, we were able to trace down and contact a living descendant who just happened to be the owner of the chest. The chest is fortunately labeled, descended in the family of the owners to the present, and once featured inscriptions of two 19th century owners of the chest, Sophia Smead Wheeler and her daughters Harriet Esther Wheeler, both residents of Greenfield, Massachusetts, their names being once inscribed on the inside of the second drawer of the chest. The piece is of great interest because it demonstrates that Clay was beginning to respond to newer styles and the newer demands of his customers. More importantly, it illustrates the fluidity and complexity of furniture design in New England in the early 19th century. If this chest were not labeled, it could have easily been mistaken as being made in the North Shore area of Massachusetts or the coastal region of New Hampshire, such as Portsmouth. Pieces produced in Portsmouth, New Hampshire, such as the one seen here on the screen, exhibit many similarities to the chest produced by clay, including the large bow front, reeded legs, and veneered drawer fronts. However, one cannot rule out that clay may have been inspired by pieces produced by other Greenfield area cabinet makers that were copying the North Shore style. Cabinet makers Spooner and Fitz of nearby Athol, Massachusetts, for instance, produced pieces, such as this example on the screen, that were also similar to items produced in Portsmouth and could have also served as a design inspiration for clay. The piece consequently broadens our understanding of regionalism and reinforces the point that style was not confined to a particular geographical area, but was far more fluid and spread quite quickly. The final discovery I would like to share was not produced by Clay, but owned by him and successive generations of his family. For several decades, historic Deerfield was aware of the existence of a portrait of Daniel Clay and his wife Lucinda, but time had rendered their whereabouts unknown. As luck would have it, the owners of the portrait contacted Deerfield just over a year ago when they saw the museum had organized a small exhibit on Daniel Clay, curated by my colleague Christine Rytok, and images of which can be seen here on the screen. The owners, direct descendants of Daniel and Lucinda Clay, wanted to loan the portraits to historic Deerfield. The paintings seen here, which were likely done in New York in the 1840s by an unknown artist, picture Daniel and his wife in the later years of their life when they were living in New York. They are incredible survivals, as very few paintings of early New England cab cabinet makers survive to the present day. As can be seen here, Daniel's portrait joins just a small group of known New England cabinet maker portraits. More importantly, the portrait of Clay provides us with information regarding the latter part of Clay's life in New York, of which we have very little information, and serves to also contradict past scholarship on Clay, which presents him as somewhat of a business failure. These portraits arguably present a very different story. The way in which Daniel and Lucinda are seated, with eyes staring at the viewer, exudes a feeling of confidence, stability, and respectability, suggesting Clay was able to achieve a degree of comfort and stability later in life when working in New York City as a druggist. This theory is further corroborated by the fact that Clay was buried in New York City's renowned Greenwood Burying Ground, the entrance to which can be seen on the left here, and Clay's tombstone on the right. Greenwood, a beautiful Garden Park cemetery, 
houses the remains of other notable Americans, including New York cabinet maker Duncan Fife and Samuel F. B. Morse. Finally, while these discoveries are interesting in and of themselves, it behooves us to consider these furnishings in their rightful context and setting, that is, as heirlooms situated in the home. In particular, the distinctive markings found on these items and their associated family histories cannot be ignored, for they contribute much in the way of how 19th and 20th century Americans perceive their homes. Whether marked with family members' names or handed down over many generations, these items, particularly for 19th century Americans, stood as visible reminders of a family's past and as symbols of the family's rootedness and stability. As the 19th century progressed and into the 20th century, these items contributed significantly to the understanding of the home as a refuge or sanctuary from the turmoil of society. This mood was reflected in popular culture of the day, including these mid to late 19th century music ballads, in which old family seating furniture was praised and adored for its association with past family members. Family heirlooms marked with the names of kin or simply passed down for generations thus became material expressions of continuity, stability, and tranquility in an age that was experiencing rapid social economic, and technological change. Other items made by Daniel Clay featuring marks and inscriptions by 19th and 20th century antiquarians serve to further illustrate the connection between family heirlooms and the idea of the home as sanctuary. Take, for instance, this tall case clock made by Daniel Clay with the granny notes secured to the interior. The old granny label, likely a 20th century creation, outlines the clock's history of ownership and its descent in the Ripley family of Greenfield, Massachusetts. It reads, quote, My great-grandfather Jerome Ripley's clock, on the stairs. Afterward, next, grandfather Franklin Ripley had it, and when my grandmother died, Frank Manning bought it of the estate, and after Lottie Manning died in 1900, and Margaret Ann died in 1911, Frank gave it to me, Mary D. Greeno, end quote. Written for posterity, the note reveals Mary Greeno's desire to leave a record of the clock's ownership stretching back to the 18th century. More importantly, however, the author makes the effort to locate the clock, quote, on the stairs in the home of the clock's original owner. Regardless of whether the note is factually true or not, we can see here the efforts of the contemporary owner to enhance not only the importance of the object itself, but also to enrich the domestic space by drawing connections to the objects and homes of their ancestors. One final example makes this same connection, albeit with more dramatic language. This chest of drawers attributed to Clay features a large late 19th century inscription on the reverse. The author of the inscription, Jenny Marie Arm Sheldon of Deerfield, Mass., was eager not only to list the owners of the chest and its descendants in the family, but also its location over several generations. It reads, quote, Avis Steven Arms's Bureau, ASA, born 1785, died 1859, carried to Canada 1829, brought back 1833 cherished by Avis S. Arms till her death, 1899, who wished to have it come back to the dear old home. May it always be sacred. J.N.A.S. End quote. Shelton's choice of words to describe the chest, including cherished and sacred, give it the status of a relic, functioning to enrich the domestic space by allowing owners to draw connections to past generations. Her note that the Bureau was, quote, carried to Canada also reveals her clear awareness of her heritage and history, referencing the experience of a number of Deerfield residents who were carried off to Canada by the French and Native peoples in the famous 1704 raid on Deerfield. This, along with her description of the house in which the chest resided as, quote, the dear old home, further underscores the vision of the home as a symbol of permanence, stability, 
and longevity. In summary then, while these new furniture discoveries certainly add nuance to the narrative of Clay's life in furniture scholarship, they remind us too of the important place of family heirloom pieces in the context of the American home. Whether marked, unmarked, or simply passed down from generation to generation, these pieces helped to communicate and contribute to an understanding of the home as a respite from the public arena, an area into which man could find solace, peace, strength, and renewal from the turmoil of the outside world. By keeping furniture in the family, Americans sought to draw upon the strengths of past generations in order to create stable home environments for the present generation and for future generations that followed. Thank you.